Hello, Theories of Everything community and friends and anyone else who is interested in uh, Theories of Everything. Um, so today we're going to do a, uh, a presentation on unity theory, which is trying to explain reality, all of it. Um, and uh, we're going to dive into this presentation and try to explain um, things on a level that hopefully most people will be able to understand. Most people are interested in this kind of stuff. We have here Daniel Varga uh, from Budapest. And we have Roy Dobson from Canada in British Columbia. My name is James. I'm also from Canada uh, on the East Coast at the moment. And um, <clears throat> the th just to give a, a little bit of a context, the three of us kind of came together through the Theories of Everything community, which is a um, show slash interview podcast thing uh, that Kurt Jaimungle uh, began about two years and a half ago, something like that. And through the Discord community, there's a lot of people like ourselves who are interested in abstract thinking, interdisciplinary um, fields and phil phil philosophy and um, trying to build our own models of reality and that sort of thing. So, um, Daniel, uh, do you want to introduce your JCT uh, real quick and then we can go to Roy as well? Just the general idea, because we're going to dive into this stuff anyway. Yeah. All or right. introduce so... yourself if you wish. Yeah, well, uh, I'm Daniel Vargo from Hungary, and I studied environmental engineering and some data, data science. And now I'm just focusing on uh, my theory framework. This is a broader, big historical, holistic framework that I am working with. It's called now Jumping Continuity Theory, or GCT at short. And uh, basically, this tries to explain the complexity we see in, in our world and the emergent phenomenon. So that's where I'm focusing on most of my effort. All right, cool. And Roy? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so <laughs> uh, the, f the most fundamental model of reality possible. So I've been trying to figure out this reality thing for 24 years now and uh a lot of meditation and um yeah so just basically boiling the theory down to its most fundamental you can't get any closer to you can't get a more accurate efficient model that i don't know i it my, to me, my my theory explains everything. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is actually a good segue know, into. Oh, it's uh, big in scope is that I don't know how to really explain it. Sorry. Yeah. Well, that's that why we're all here, right? Like, yeah. there. Even if you do have insight into the fundamental nature of reality, then the question is, how do you communicate it to people? And so yeah. it's a good segue into what I do, which is that I connect things. Um, my philosophy is called paradoxism, but um, the three of us, we came together about a year and a half ago now um, and uh, developed something called unity theory. And so there's a se this is a second iteration of, uh, of our theory because a year ago we, we hadn't worked out the ideas as much yet. Now they've matured a little bit more and something happened recently. Um, we uh, discovered that in a way we've resolved the Münchhausen trilemma, which is something we're going to get into right now, actually. So um, I want to do a snapshot overview and I've actually um, created this presentation with a snapshot overview. So anybody can be like, OK, it's been four or five minutes now. I've been listening to these guys, but I just want to know what this whole presentation is going to be from the get go. And then I'll decide if I'm interested in going uh, deeper or not. So um, that's what we're going to do right now. Let me just share my screen. Okay. So hopefully you guys can see this. Do you see the, yep. the presentation there? Yes. All right, cool. So I'm not going to, well, maybe I could do a, maybe full screen it. I don't know if I can screen it, but this is, this seems to be good enough. So um, once again, this is called unity theory. But uh, it really it consists of three different theories. One is uh, jumping continuity theory, which uh, if you hear it carefully, jumping continuity, there's a paradox in that. Uh -huh. My theory is called paradoxism. 
and Roy's is called non-conceptuality. So technically you should just keep your mouth shut and that's Roy's theory. <laughs> There's really no name for it, but that's the name that, that he's used. And really the valuable thing about Roy's theory is the triune system. And the second thing I would say would be the base 10 jump. So the, this explanation of the number line and how it resets and why it resets and so on. So we're going to look at that throughout this presentation as well. So the combination of the three seem to have fit together to create unity theory. And um, really what a theory should be is to try to resolve something called the Minchhausen trilemma or the Agrippin trilemma. And we're going to explain that in a second. And uh, really what it is, is that when you're trying to establish and prove a fundamental truth, uh, anybody who works on that problem or challenge will run into one, two, or all three of the following issues. Uh, number one is circular reasoning. Second is infinite regress. And the third is an arbitrary starting point. Um, so those are the three of the Munchausen trilemma. But historically, this goes back really, really far to um, Sextus Empiricus, who uh, who himself had perhaps created Agrippa as a character to because um, he was a skeptic and um, he used uh, storytelling, I guess, kind of like uh, Socrates did to describe um, certain philosophical issues. And he had actually five modes. So those, those are the three, but there's five and they just seem kind of redundant. So, but just mention them just so that anybody who's really uh, pedantic could be like, well, Okay, you got that covered. So uh, the fourth one would be the mode of agreement, which is that individuals disagree due to subjective interpretation and mode of differences, which is that individuals diametrically oppose others and themselves due to the complexity. So it's just, they disagree and not only do they disagree, but they also oppose each other. So, and that's just, it all boils down to subjective interpretation. So you could say there's really only four modes of the Munchausen trilemma. All right. So uh, we're going to go to the next slide, unless you guys have anything to add to that. Well, it's pretty arbitrary to put the starting point as number three. That's me trying to... Yeah, well, yeah, you, you could put it at number one. one. But I'll, do you think... You could arbitrarily put it in number three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's a joke there. <laughs> what, do you, <laughs> what do you guys think there's value maybe in describing what it is? What does it mean to, to, to do circular reasoning or to fall into infinite regress? You guys want to cover that for anybody that might be watching? Or do you think people who are watching are probably already know about this? Oh, they probably get it. If, if they're watching this, they, they understand turtles all the way, I'm all right. sure. Cool. So... Uh, you know, should a theory be conclusive or should it be useful? This is where things become interesting because uh, we have Daniel on one side who's super utilitarian based, um, predictive and so on. And then Roy, you, you believe that a theory should be conclusive, right? Um, so I'm just revisiting the work that we had done to categorize what kinds of theories that there exists and what they should and should not be doing. Um, so f for now, we could say that it's both that having conclusion is useful, but utility is necessary. So, you know, if you have conclusion, if you have an answer, then what? Well, you just go on about your daily life. But when it comes to explaining reality in total, you, you don't typically it looks like humanity isn't satisfied with having conclusion. They can sit there and meditate or, you know, be enlightened, but they go around trying to find out better ways to do activities and so on. Right. So. The, the question is, how can we integrate conclusion and utility within a theory? Um, and then the third thing that I've written here is the what, when, where, who, how, and why, which is something that we had discussed in the very first TOE conference, and that was really brilliant. Um, it seemed that everyone, there's a consensus that anyone who's working on a theory of everything that is comprehensive will, will necessarily need to describe what we're talking about, when it's happening, where it is, who, meaning what, what identity can we give it, how it works or emerges, and then why. Why being what could be the most difficult uh, question to answer. Um, and then we had gone through four different types. So one is an identitarian theory, which means that uh, you're giving an identity to reality by describing it. Um, and then functional, which is more about describing how reality emerges and how it functions from the human-centric point of view. The third here we had was predictive. So it, it describes the patterns and then extrapolates future cycles. So it makes predictions about what's going to happen 
uh, down the line. And then uh, finally, at number four, we have a complete, which is the combination of all three, and then includes a self description. It has to be sort of self referencing so that you can be fully comprehensive. Now, every single one of these will have elements of the others in it. It just makes sense that way. Uh, being as uh, a theory of everything is about integrating everything. So naturally, this is what's going to happen. So, you know, people can debate this all day long, but I just want to throw that out there so they know that I realize that. Um, okay, so that allows us to move forward uh, about what our theory looks like and what it's about. So one, I just want to introduce this. So for anyone listening, the uh, what I'm about to present is a new level of understanding and depth to unity theory that I haven't actually uh, told Daniel and Roy yet. So we're just going to discuss things among ourselves more than we are going to be presenting this uh, for everyone. Um, so you can follow along pretty easily anyway, because we're going to describe things clearly. But um, this is uh, just uh, the caveat that I wanted to, to say first. So generally speaking, the trilemma that uh, we went through that I described, it's an error to think that that trilemma is an error. Like that is the error, that perhaps those three things, infinite regress, circularity, and an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary starting point actually function together that they are features of reality and not an error in human reason. And the second thing is that there is unity between emergence and singularity. So respectively, we could look at uh, Daniel's theory, which is about emergence, right? It's about um, every level of reality in, in physics, you know, from uh, atoms to chemistry to, you know, multicellular life, human beings, cities, and so on. And then singularity, it's the opposite. It's Roy who, who um, uses his triune system to um, collapse everything to a singularity, that everything really is the same. There's an underlying substrate and reality to all of it. So Daniel works on why is there an emergence and how it works, what are the relationships between the levels and all that stuff. And um, Roy focuses on how it all collapses to, to one or zero, which is something we're going to and discuss. also arises from that and collapses into it. It also... Exactly. So Singularity is from which it arises and also passes. Yeah. So there's this this strange thing where the future is happening at the same time as the past. There's uh, an emergence and a collapsing at the same time. This is exactly what we're going to dive into uh, throughout this presentation, actually. Yeah. Uh, so far, Daniel and uh, Roy, you guys think this is a good start to, to everything? Have I yeah. missed anything? No. Yeah, I think it's a good start. Yeah. Cool. So we have to look at that this breakdown visually, and we can see it right here. Uh, so I'm still a, in a bit of a snapshot overview mode. So anybody can really say, okay, this is what they're going to be talking about, and this is what they uh, they're doing with unity theory. And really, it breaks down into two things. Like I said, you guys have your respective sides, but they they're ultimately one thing. And we're going to understand how we can connect those two things together. So with emergence, or what I call fiat lux, let there be light, um, there are certain elements that we're going to look like uh, look at. And in uh, collapse, which is the singularity, in other words, um, because it collapses to what? To a singularity. There shares other things that are very, very similar. There seems to be a uh, direct correspondence, right? For example, they both share a paradox. They both have a paradox that reflects each other. So this is what's interesting that I, uh, the interesting thing that I realized um, as I was talking to both of you and, and understanding more of what you guys are talking about over the last year. Um, and the important thing to note is that both of these systems that you're both describing are both correct and exist simultaneously. What I call is the I call it the great paradox. It's this antinomy, which is a, a type of paradox I'll describe at the end of the presentation. So, sound interesting so far? Yeah. Yes. All right, cool. I'm going to take a breath once in a while, too. I tend to <laughs> tire myself out. I hold but, my breath um, when having sex quite a bit, but yeah, same thing. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't really done presentations like that for a while, so it's like <laughs> I'm holding my breath and like to yeah, just got to remember I'm human, too. Uh, okay, so um, – the new thing that has brought us together here today, again, really is the, the trilemma and JCT. So jumping continuity theory. I've, I've realized there's a really, it's, that's the main feature of 
this presentation insofar as the new thing that has emerged. Um, and what it is is that I've realized that um, Daniel, your your jumping continuity th theory is really shown through graphs. Everything is through graphs, right? And what it does is it gives a framework and a visual representation of how those three aspects of the trilemma really are reconciled or part of one thing. And in order to understand how they are part of one thing, you have to understand what Roy is talking about, which is that they all collapse to that one thing. So you have to think in two modes at the same time. And once you're able to do that, you actually start to conceptualize this theory of everything called unity theory. All right. So it sounds complicated, but it really is this kind of like switch in your brain that you got to try to, um, to achieve. Okay. So I don't want to present these too much because we're literally going to go into every one of them. Um, but, uh, I think so far we've done pretty good that this is the, the one thing that I really want to present to you guys. So we can do some discussion about that. Uh, but don't forget, we have about 25 slides. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that I want to present for anybody who's going to be watching. I do consider this to be our first real shot at explaining unity theory. And um, so this is why I'm going to go through stuff that we've already discussed, which is okay, because we won't have to debate about it too much. But here in the first half of this presentation, we should debate this a little bit. This is where we have to try to understand stuff together. So let's give ourselves some, some time to philosophize about it. Um, and so really there are other concepts that we're going to bring into this that have already been well established long ago and somewhat recently in other ways um, throughout this presentation. And, and these are things that people are going to have to go and, and look into to understand. But uh, they're axiomatic truths that are relevant to uh, both of your theories and, 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 and how I bring them together. So division by zero, for example, Ramanujan's work, if anybody doesn't know what that means, um, it's important to go and see that. Um, and then I've already mentioned how jumping continuity theory is uh, a framework of integration, which is cool. So like if, if, if I'm already breaking down this, I'm just going to go here and, uh, unpack it a little bit more. So one of the things so, so one of the things that I really should be describing for people to understand is the triune system first because the trilemma that we discussed is a counterpart to the triune. So if you look at um, if you look at emergence here, Daniel, you're you're dealing with the trilemma. You're dealing with infinite regress, right, of your levels going up and down. You're dealing with its circularity, and you're dealing with arbitrary starting points every level themselves. And then, uh, Roy, your collapse deals with the trion system. How do you collapse everything to a singularity? Well, you got to do it in three parts because the world thinks in dualities, and they're not able to achieve one. They, they go too far, right? They, they actually start at two versus actually realizing one. But how do you get to one when you're stuck in that dualism? Well, you need to use three. And so... It's kind of interesting because the trying system. I just want to interject that, that how science yeah. starts with two, right? Science starts yeah. with duality. It starts with space time, and then it comes up with a coordinate out of space time, right? So that's the exact opposite way to do it. They're starting at two exactly. to try to get to one, right? Like right off that's the right. hop, you can see how maybe that'll be problematic. Yeah, they're starting with space-time and that's wrong because there's something more fundamental to space-time when yeah. you're trying to understand how space-time emerges how can you start with space-time that is literally and i'm going to go to this slide the munchausen yeah, trilemma it's him pulling himself out by his own hair it doesn't make any sense yeah uh, maybe maybe i'll just add here something so sure so maybe people could understand this uh in a layman term, if, if I tell them like 10,000 years ago, we didn't have any metric to measure. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a meter. We didn't have a second. So those metrics are, are a, a mental representation of, of a hum, human culture. So basically we made up those numbers and, and those parameters and scales. So, how I imagine this, and, and also for Roy, I guess, um, for me, 
and every entity can build up their metric system. And from there, they, they build up the word, how they represent or just explain. Usually nowadays, I just, I just uh, talk about this. The, the map is not the territory. The map, we are building up the map, just, just making mental, for humans, we're making mental map, maps how things should work out. But, uh, but actually, that's not the reality itself. We have to realize this. Yeah, I, I cover that too at the very uh, end of the uh, in simulacra and simulations is something that Jean Baudrillard talks about. So we'll get to that as well. Um, all right. So moving forward, and again, so right now we're dealing with Daniel, your stuff first, and then Roy will come. So right now we're dealing with the emergence, with fiat lukes, with reality, physics, and all the levels and all the stuff that we have to deal with, what people normally start with. Um, so uh, going back to that, like I said, the trilemma is a counterpart to the triune, is the triune collapses the trilemma and the trilemma emerges out of the triune. And we're going to understand what that means uh, a little bit later for anybody who doesn't understand what the triune system is. It's just a way of dividing any concept into three that allows you to see how they actually are one and the same thing. Um, a special and type then, of three, right? I'm sorry? Superposition. Superposition. It's a superposition. Yep. Exactly. And I actually also have some slides here to help people yep. visualize what a superposition is. Um, division by zero, how it all begins. So really any action, any uh, movement or thoughts is what starts to create something. And in mathematics, it's a division by zero. When you divide zero by zero, you generate any number you want. That's a mathematical way of saying that any thought that occurs or awareness uh, that occurs, it actually generates reality. So we're going to describe that um, in all these correspondences a little bit later as well. Um, then here we have JST integrates the observer and ipso facto, meaning from itself, uh, the resulting trilemma. So when you, when you look at a level, you, the observer, are looking at that level. So maybe you're observing an atom or maybe you're observing a city, right? And so the observer is included in JCT. Just want people to realize that. Um, and then here I have the paradox of JCT. So here's the, the main issue with ju jumping continuity theory. This is what people need to understand. There's a paradox typically that you're going to run into everywhere when you're creating a theory. And the question is, are those paradoxes something that we use or something that we try to surp like o overlook or, or pass through as if though it has to be resolved in some way. There are some paradoxes that you don't resolve, that they, they are just a feature of reality. So with JCT, um, the question is, how can uniform reality, because reality, if it is uniform, if there is really just one substrate, okay, one thing, uh, then it means that it is uniform. Uh, at base, one potential or however you want to use that word. So if there is really a uniform reality, how can it have discrete units or how can you discrete units emerge from it? And that's where the jumps in continuity come from. Um, but it's interesting because the, these, uh, the jump in continuity theory also shows how every continuity between the jumps, so meaning Everything in between, for example, an atom and the first molecule for chemistry that is composed of atoms, what happens in between? There's a continuous aspect, but like, is there another unit in between? And there seems to be an infinite amount of continuity or, or jumps or units in between levels that we do observe. That's where the infinite, like, uh, that's where uh, contours stuff would come in mathematically, right? Um, is what would you call it set theory and so on and uh and uh, just infinities of infinities like this fantastical just the number stuff. system itself really and yeah yeah even just in, in exactly and then here finally i have the trilemma as a result of human experience of infinity a physical counterpart to potential what did i mean by that the trilemma as a result of human experience. Ah, okay, yeah. So, for example, a trilemma, this idea that you fall into infinite regress. For example, if you say, here's what God is. Well, what created God? Okay, X. Well, what created X and so on. This is regress for anybody who doesn't know what that means. Um, this is a human thing, right? This, the trilemma 
is something that we see as a is a human experience. Uh, we are the ones who fall into infinite regress and circularity with our reasoning, and then we start arbitrarily in different points. But um, that's just a feature of reality uh, as well. So not only is it as a human experience, which we thought, oh, look, this is must be an error because everything that we try to explain falls into those three things. So we think there's got to be an error. But no, it's like, just accept reality for what it is. This is actually it. The question is, why is it the reality? And how does it work together? And this is what we're going to uh, look at next, which is here. Um, jumping continuity theory uh, visually explained is, is this. Uh, now, the question is, is this big enough for you guys? Can you see? Um, it's, it could be that a little bit bigger. Um... You, if you can zoom in at least just to the main graph, that might help. Okay. Like, Let's yeah, yeah that's, that's bigger. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, jumping continuity. So we have here uh, at the either side of the graphs, right? We have these little X's where what they could be is the, the X's means is the next thing to come. Uh, so, for example, here we have multicellular scale, then we have multi multicellular scale. And then, but really, it could also be infinity sign because it goes on forever. And that's uh, the infinite regress that we run into when we think, well, there's an issue here. So, um, just make sure that you correct me, Daniel. Don't, for, don't be afraid to jump in there if I'm describing something wrong. Uh, but um, this is just something I wanted to present to people. And... It might seem very simplistic to anybody looking at this, but there's a lot that goes into it, and it, it's much more complex, of course. It can get as complex as you want it to be, and Daniel has many, many, many different graphs that uh, are essentially just correspondences to these things. So, for example, we're looking at physics and, and just the matter of reality and what we experience primarily, but he has correspondences with our technologies. So we start with steam engine, and we go to electricity and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, there are correspondences in every imaginable way. But another complex thing that this doesn't show you is that there's a computational value that Daniel has uh, created or come up with um, that allows us to predict when these levels happen. And there seems to be a pattern that emerges, kind of like um, Moore's law in computation, right? Every 18 months or something like that, computation computational power doubles. Now, people thought that Moore's law was going to end because we're no longer using classical computing. We're trying to use uh, quantum bits and so on. But ironically, computation even before classical computing, so regular computing or analog computing, it continues. This trend that Kurzweil um, uses to predict the, the next kind of evolution, evolutionary jumps in technology, it it actually goes across these fundamental technologies. So one might say, well, if the evolution finishes at, the, uh, at let's say, uh, classical computing, and then we have to start all over again from the top or from the ground up with quantum computing, or th for some reason, no, like there isn't a straight evolution and, and, and it is on the curve and it is on time. So that tells you that there's something special happening in reality. And Daniel has um, figured that out, but not just for computation, which is easy to predict because you're you're looking at some uh, concrete values, right? You're looking, you can make predictions quite easily because you're looking at, uh, at uh, real live data. But when you're lo looking outside of that scope, when you're looking at physics itself and matter and, and trying to see how it progresses and how it evolves, then it's a, a lot more complex. I still don't understand it. And I think Daniel is still doing some work to, to write your paper, but here's where we're at now so far. And when it comes to those values and how that how you predict those things, it's something that'll come later, I guess. But I think I've presented it pretty well so far. There are two different things as well with JCT that or two concepts that are required to understand it um, is that you have two principles. One is the here and now principle. And this is what this little guy represents. And he's here and now, um, which is obviously going to be past the multicellular scale because we are um, multicellular being, beings, but we are composed so of these other the, beings. That would be the observer, right? The observer is always here and now, right? That's yes. exactly it. Yeah. But here's the interesting part. 
if you're looking at say the cellular scale or the atomic scale you the, that is you become the observer like that becomes the observer if you use the atomic scale as a reference point that then becomes the observer that's what's so revolutionary about this because then it starts to explain um different things that i'm about to to get into but before i do in the here and now principle which is that roy like you said it's about um realizing that uh the observer is on the timeline in the here and now and that um, all these other levels that we're looking downwards or in the past uh, versus in the future, they're all relative to that observer. Okay, so it's a relativistic theory. And the second principle is the limits principle. And this is something that we're going to see here in this graph, um, which is that there are limits to what we can predict. And that's what these cones kind of look like. Is there the boundaries of what we can predict and understand? But um, beyond that, we don't know. However, what's special with Daniel's theory is that because we have, we have data going backwards, it allows us to see a pattern that we can extrapolate into the future. But all you're going to be able to say about the future is that this pattern is going to continue. You don't know what it's going to look like or how it's going to, to develop. And that's where, you know, ignorance comes in where you have, you know, we're never going to be able to uh, predict everything perfectly, uh, infinitely, obviously. But we can understand that that's the system and how it works. And that's what Daniels uh, allows us to do. So the cool thing is, is here on either side of the spectrum, you have infinite regress, right? But regress is really anything. So if the observer is here and then he tries to explain multicellular life, he's going to have to go to cellular scale and say, well, that's what's multicellular life. But then you always have that possibility of another question and you go down backwards. Then the, the interesting thing is we stop somewhere. For us, as we move up this line, it seems it's a strange thing that we seem to develop more technology that allows us to also see further back. So at some point we could only see multicellular scale. Then we but as we moved forward and became beings uh, that had a greater collection, right, of of, of uh, intelligence and uh, cells and so on. We were capable of developing uh, insight into the cellular scale with microscopes. And they went on with electronic microscopes that allowed us to see atoms and so on and so forth until we got to the bedrock of what we're at now, which is quantum physics. But even then, we're already starting to theorize that uh, quantum particles really are formed out of frequencies. And these frequencies you might not be able to see, but they, they exist. And then, you know, who knows how we can go up from here and then continue seeing backwards. So this, this tells you something special. That if, if we can move forward and evolve and there's like this greater complexity that emerges, that also allows you to see the simplicity out of which it emerges at the same time at a greater resolution, it tells you that, that ultimately there's a circularity aspect to it. And that's why the, the, the here and now principle is very important to understand in relation to the limits principle, because the limit is really only what you can see from your point of view. So if we were to be stuck at the atoms, we're just atoms buzzing together. Uh, we really had a smaller cone of, uh, and that would be our limit. Our limit would be much smaller of what we could see, which really we could only see the structures that we're forming um, between each other and the electrons that are flinging around, uh, popping in and out of existence, right? So um, the, you're starting to see now how regress, an arbitrary starting point is not arbitrary. That's what's interesting about this. You look at any point on this timeline and you see that it's all relevant. It becomes relevant because you are now, the, because it becomes the point of the observation. It becomes the observer. So if you're looking at the multicellular scale, in relation to that scale, that, that becomes the observer and then everything on either side has a relationship to that. But then if you move up to the human scale, well, that's what becomes the observer and then everything in relation to the observer. So it makes every point on the infinite timeline of reality relevant. There is no such thing as an arbitrary starting point, technically. Or there is in one fashion, but but at the same time, as you choose that arbitrary starting point, it's no longer arbitrary, it becomes relevant. You, and that's what's so trippy just... about you can't choose to start yeah. in between the starting points. That's what's right. It's almost predetermined so, where the starting points are, where you can jump in. That's a great observation. And that's where we have a jump in the jumping continuity theory. So really, that's one of the questions that we still have to work on is uh, 
what, what what is going on with that continuity there between these jumps? Are there smaller discrete units that we're just not seeing? And why? Or are those just vast infinities of continuity? Um, you know, these are questions that some people are getting closer at like observing. Um, I think Gurdjieff is at the very end of this presentation we're going to look at, Gurdjieff's enneagram. But really all he does is form uh, correspondences between physics, maths, chemistry and every little every other um, mode of analysis possible but um, I think this is what our sciences are trying to do is we're trying to understand things like that right how are things coming together and what are their relationships and what's going on between them and all and all that stuff uh, that's really the I would say the hard thing and the you know perhaps not relevant thing to to describing reality right now but it would be that might be the immutable difficulty the thing we'll never be able to get to know but that's what's cool about this theory is that moving forward it might be possible that we have insight in between these levels that we'll have the technology to understand because when we were cells we didn't understand anything and now we do understand lots of, uh, of things so there's nothing like daniel says uh when we arrive at that that next jump that next level which gets faster and faster as you go up um you're not gonna we're not going to know we're going to have a paradigm shift that's going to allow us to have a different reality and we're not going to know what that's going to entail so for now this is how things are working we see jumps in continuity so i've dealt yeah. with circularity i've dealt I, with I will, uh, I will add something. sorry james yeah go ahead yeah uh go ahead roy and then no, I'm, I just, don't I'm forget i don't see you guys when i talk so if just cut me off so that i can Go ahead, Daniel. All right. I just wanted to uh, add here or highlight. If you go, if you go, can go back to share the screen, I will mm -hmm. just uh, try to add here something. Uh, but we would like to highlight. Uh, so, so if you see the the vertical line, white vertical line under the human uh, picture, you see there is the the today now, like two thousand twenty four. March 24. So, so actually, that's that's where we are now and here and looking back to the future or just somewhere here. The important part is there. You see the 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 horizontal uh, dashed line, the city scale. That means, uh, you know, we have this two scale already represented. We can check how far we can go or have been gone. And when is now? If you if we use this method and we go back to the unicellular uh, dot, if you imagine we, we move this uh, vertical line to the cell cellular scale, um, then you can imagine if you if you being a cellular organism, if they would know this theory they would have predicted how much time they need to go to the multicellular scale and how much time they need to go to the city scale where we are now. So basically, they could have predicted this moment, what we are talking about. And as you mentioned earlier, what they couldn't really predict is we will use Zoom or uh, Riverside to present this presentation and connect to Internet. But they could say there will be most likely uh, an organism which is this big. You can see 10 to the fourth meter in the city and we are around 10 to the zero meter as a human being. So they could predict this, uh, how big we are. And that's what I can just do with this theory. We can predict from now uh, in the... We will finish in the multi multicellular scale in, after the city just matures as, as a multicellular, multicellular organism. It will be around 10 to the 6 in three dimension. So it is lots of layers in this graph. But uh, if you understand and can read this graph, that's actually a logarithmic, logarithmic graph. So this is not a linear, linear graph, but usually you see a line. This is not a line in re in a reality. This is a hyperbolic scale. So that's really important to uh, just highlight. 
I just stopped you now. Yes, no, very good. Uh oh. Come on back. I don't James. hear you now. Come on back, James. Don't leave us, James. He just lost his Wi Fi or something. Uh oh. Because you hear me, I hear you. <clears throat> yeah, you and I can still chat. <laughs> uh, that was clear for you, uh, Roy. And did you did you understand this when I tried to explain? Yeah. Before, yeah I'm, without I'm, a graph. Ah, uh, no, it's 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 a lot clearer than it was like a year ago for sure. So nice. each one okay. of the so. If you were to put that on a linear scale, each one of those would be an exponential function, right? Like they would be basically, if you pan back as far as you could, there would almost be complete right angles that we're looking at, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is how it fits in with my awareness coming back onto itself is that it, it develops, it always develops into a, a positive self-enforcing feedback loop. And then that, if that isn't somehow quelled, if it just keeps going, then it, it develops into an exponential function. And then instead of collapsing, it, it, it basically, I don't know, like it, it jumps, right? That's the jump part is when the exponential function is basically straight up, right? Yeah. yeah. And then a new thing emerge or new, new. new yeah. A new a new place where you can have a new uh, frame of reference for the observer, right? It seems like those are almost baked into the cake, right? It's almost like these are programmed. You can't just pop in and be an observer anywhere. You have to be an observer from the cellular realm or from the molecular realm or from the atomic realm, right? No, James, what James just in my computer shut up. Yeah, he will come back. He just can uh, he pop back in? I hope so. Yeah. Oh, he probably didn't have it plugged in. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> sometimes he just doesn't. Yeah. So what right. what I'm seeing, right? I'm I'm trying to fit this in with my theory, of course, right? So. It's secular, right? Like it's all of this to me expresses a secular fashion, a secular process, right? So you start, if you look at a clock, you just go back to where you start, right? Yeah. But you can count that there's, there's something about uh, differentiation too, right? Like it's like each iteration, you can count an iteration, but then there's distinction that comes from, I don't know, like, <laughs> there, <clears throat> but do you see it as a cyclical process, right? Like it's a linear expression of a cyclical process. Yeah. So, so that, that's, that's a little bit of disagreement, I think, with you and me. Okay. But uh, I see is um, and and this this is what we would like we try to explain here. This is the it's it looks like cyclical, but it's uh, in reality not. Like like um, okay, so we as human humans we just look back now to in the past like checking atoms and. And we are doing the same thing as a. All right, I'm back. Uh, sorry for the uh, interruption there, but um, uh, we were at. I'm just going to start sharing the screen here. We'll go back to where we were. And if this happens again, then you'll know what happened. My Windows is crashing. Ah, I'm talking about technology and stuff. So uh, we were at this line here. I'm not sure exactly what I was saying in relation to it, but I was pretty much coming cl to a close about it anyway, that uh, really what we have here, oh yeah, because Daniel, you had given me the floor after you explained that this is logarithmic and that really uh, these um, 
these uh, levels aren't aren't linear like this. That it's it's uh, yeah, that really you have to think in all other dimensions, right? So we have circularity that these two uh, ends of the spectrum that we have that limits where we can't see beyond it. Um, that is infinite regress. Uh, and infinite regress is at any time we jump from one level to another. Uh, the arbitrary starting, and, and so the circularity comes from the fact that infinity on both ends makes you realize that that there isn't a linear thing happening, that this line is actually curving around into a circle. And that's where circularity comes in. Um, and then the arbitrary starting point we had described was really just that every point that is arbitrary that you choose becomes relevant because you're the observer. And that also ties in consciousness. So um, this is a lot of abstract stuff, but we've, we have at least a visual representation now that can start to help us think a little bit more in terms of how everything relates to each other uh, from the point of view of a human being experiencing a physical world. Um, so the next thing to look at would be that circularity a little bit more, right? And really trying to understand uh, what that means when we're talking about time. So Daniel and I uh, just last week looked at how really when you're thinking about, and this is really on my phone there, I made this. Um, when you have that those infinities on either side of the line with all these arbitrary starting points, that when you're talking about time, as a, an observer looking backwards, so that's the trick. You don't look into the past. You have to look backwards because if you remove space and time, which is what we need to do in order to start to understand fundamental reality and how space and time works, then you start to realize that you have to use other words like backwards and forwards or underneath and, and above. And then you start to understand that, oh, now I understand the circularity of the graph because if you are an observer looking, let's say right now, we're always looking upwards, right? Looking forwards, looking into the future. So then we start to see things have to get bigger, right? There's that correspondence, uh, bigger, wider, further, stronger. We have all of these correspondences when we use our language to describe the levels that we're looking at going up. So cities are bigger than humans. Humans are bigger than organs. Organs are bigger than multicellular processes and so on and, and so forth. So, but if you turn around and you look downwards and you look into the past, well, those things are still there. They're not in the past, right? Like your cells are still in the present moment here and now. They are smaller in relation to you. But here's the thing. Here's the trick. If you were to zoom in to the level of the cell, so when you're looking down that microscope and you're actually looking at the cell, the cell in relation to you observing it is bigger than, than, than you. You feel small, right? So what is big or or closer or in the or in the future or you know all these different terms really is relative based on the observer so if the observer looks backwards they're looking backwards in time it actually becomes the future it becomes the forward direction so this is why i have these here right that that uh and we're all we're already looking at that in science right people are saying well maybe there's uh a block universe where the, the future simultaneously creates the past and that, you know, there's all these different weird ways of looking at time. Well, that, I do believe that that is probably what is happening is that we're, we're thinking of time in a way that is in a linear fashion that is static, but it's not. It depends on what the observer is looking at and when and from what level. And that's what makes things a bit more complex. But uh, Zeno's paradoxes and other things like that go to prove it with a thought experiment, right? That space and time are illusory. And I think that's what Roy would really agree with, right? And we're going to dive into that. James, I just that. Sent, you, sent you on uh, Facebook the, the yeah. graph. I think you should just, just show a moment of the sure. linear, lean, lean log, log uh, graph. Okay. So well, <clears throat> I think maybe it's okay to use space and time, but I don't want them to be connected into space-time. So if uh, there's no spatial separation between the body and the cells, right? There, you're not, there's no spatial separation between those smaller realms, right? So is there any yeah. space between an atom 
or, or between the subatomic particles and the atom, are there any, is there any space, spatial separation between an atom and a molecule? Is there any spatial separation between a molecule and a cell and then a cell in the body? I would say no, there's no spatial separation there at all. So therefore, it must be time, right? They must be time separated, right? So I'm of the, I came to the view that that's our past, right? So we're looking mm -hmm. at the evolutionary steps that we have taken and to higher, from my perspective, it's all about higher levels of self-awareness. But that to me is our past. And that's why we shouldn't be messing around with that stuff. Anyway, I don't want to get into I, that. So, I'll let you keep going. No, that's fine. But, but, but the, the, the question is, it, complexity comes into play as well, right? So like when you look into the past, the, the, the questions start to emerge. Well, are we looking at something simpler or more complex? Because it's kind of both. No matter if you're looking backwards, which would be the past, or forwards, which would be the future, like, you know, is a city, so is a human being and, and all of its construction, all the organisms and processes, is that more complex than what happens in a city and all of its uh, processes? You can't really say that one is bigger or more complicated than the other in that way. And that's what's interesting about uh, this theory is that um, insofar as as it gives you a, a visual understanding of the relationship between things, it also starts to, to, to show you how the relationship between complexity and time and space and all these other concepts are connected. And that's really the only thing I want to say about this. After that, whether it's a good or bad thing or whether it's, uh, you know, whether there are, are spaces or, or even structures between the levels that we just can't have access to or maybe they don't exist because it's all illusory anyway these are not things i'm ready to look into yet i just want to at least show that there is a relationship between all of these things and that they can be reconciled so these cones you know they can be flipped backwards just as easily and then it actually ends up looking like this and this is the a really good visual representation if i'm going to zoom this in because it's worth it wouldn't that be almost like a klein bottle could these yeah, all be like Klein bottles? Sure. Hey, I'm not sure what that is. Um, what a Klein um, bottle is, um, but the um, Mobius strip, right? A Klein bottle could is a three-dimensional expression of a Mobius strip. Yeah, it could be like so. If you look at yeah. either end where there's a collapse or a singularity happening, it, there's it's like practical. an emergence. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, but in three dimensional uh, terms, this is the best way to visualize it, right? Like you have, yeah. so this side here where there's a, a, a perfect singularity, all things are collapsed to one, it really is the same thing as on this side. We're looking at the yeah. same point. It's just in between, there's an emergence of stuff, structures, processes, relationships, all this stuff that we're trying to understand. And so, uh, JCT allows us to see that and to, to understand it from a framework that is more neutral. Um, and allows us to put things together a little bit better. But, uh, Actually, yeah, so... what is this arrow points at, or I, what I wanted yeah. to point is uh, the, the arrow, the, the middle point of the arrow, the starter point, is Here? the observer. And That's right. the observer looks back at the origin of itself, or at least the, the point where it is able to. And yep. that's the important part. And that's, you can... We could do, draw this to the future in in some sense, and in a way, it is a claim battle all all the way down because this is an observer from that one perspective, one observer point of view. It it mm -hmm. is contains infinite or well, I'm not really sure, but the theory suggests it can be could be an infinite regress. It's in inside it. it. So basically, yeah. if that's just so complex no I know, I know what you mean and this is why i was telling you i think that your theory is actually pretty revolutionary because it doesn't just show you infinite regress it shows you infinite regress of infinite regress okay and well, and i'm just going to put expansion, uh, expansion or regress right expansion or regress exactly yeah. same thing it's yeah. exactly the same thing and so the, when i the, say the that linear, so the linear scale where you have a positive and a negative on the linear scale well if you circle that mm -hmm. around the positive and the negative is the same. It's the birth and the death, right? The birth exactly. and the death. 
are the same point. Superposition. Yeah. It's the, a superposition. Yeah, exactly. It's just one of those arbitrary points where we pop in and we say that there's an observer here, right? Like that's that, that point where the positive meets the negative is one of these arbitrary points, right? It's, it's both. It's arbitrary and it's relevant. And that's, that's what's interesting about, about it, right? So no matter what point you're looking at, it, it, if, if, it, if you realize that the observer, no matter what he looks at, he could be looking in the past at this point, And really what he's looking at is the future at this point or, or forwards back and backwards yeah. or looking at infinity or looking at any other number of uh, correspondences that we could come up with because ultimately there's an infinite regress of infinite regress. When you, if you want to play the game, right, uh, Roy, mm -hmm. if, if you really want to start looking into reality and the structures and trying to understand the relationships and going down all that complexity road, what you're going to look at is an infinite regress of an infinite regress. You're going to realize that there, there is an infinite regress to the power of the infinite regress and it itself has its own infinite regress. And that's what Contour uh, was working on, right, with his set theory. So um, it's just that now we have a better visual representation and it also allows us to um, demonstrate how Munchausen, Munchausen trilemma is actually a feature of reality. And that's extremely important. Whereas I think Contour was trying to uh, somehow hold infinity in the palm of his hand um, without realizing that uh, there's no need to because it's He's all to absolute infinity. anyway. You can't exactly. let, when you let the genie out of the bottle, you can't, you can't fix that mistake. He tried to fix the mistake that actually mathematics made, but I won't get into that. <laughs> yeah, and really there's nothing to fix and that's the thing we need well, to start to understand. We just, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the question is, where is this all going? Right. Uh, we need to start to understand that there's a, a relationship between infinity and eternity and that these are two different qualities of fundamental reality that we have to understand uh, aren't just compatible. There, there's a there's a, uh, a superposition between infinity and eternity. Infinity is just this discrete units. It's this it's an emergence of reality. It's uh, it's it's reality itself. It's existence. It's physics. It's everything. It's matter and energy. And so infinity is that timeline that we perceive um, and eternity is the backdrop against which or from which infinity emerges. And there's a superposition between both. And that's where the things get paradoxical and the mind doesn't understand it directly because it's trying to understand it from the point of view of a human being versus just being itself. Um, and that's where Roy, we're going to start going down into the collapse. So now we just looked at the emergence of everything, how everything emerges. Um, but at the same time, we've shown how that emergence is is simultaneously moving into a collapse. And that's where it's like, what? How can it emerge and collapse at the same time? Well, that's that's what unity theory shows. And that's, uh, I think, what's so revolutionary. So um, moving forward into, into Roy's side of things, uh, the eternal side, which is undisturbed potential, okay? It's just pure immutable reality and, and for that we need to look at Parmen Parmenides he really um, described it quite well and I'm not sure where did I put those uh... ah, right here Parmenides said that being okay is eternal unchanging indivisible uniform comprehensive and therefore immutable so these are different qualities that kind of closes the doors on all these different uh, ways that we think about reality and it says, well, unchanging would mean something that is that is um, timeless, steadfast, or sorry, what? Timeless. So timeless, in, infinity exactly. Infinity and eternity, infinity and eternity, they both mm -hmm. infer time. I don't think there's any way that you can get away from inferring time in exactly. those two words. But so yeah. we have to actually step outside of time and try to imagine the state of dreamless sleep which is timeless right so exactly when, when you talk so when about, we think of I would encourage people to imagine the state of dreamless sleep exactly so unchanging is uh, uh in reference or or unchanging is as to time as indivisible is 
as to, to, to matter. So indivisible is, is, you know, things, objects cannot be divided. Uh, uniform, meaning there's no quality that is, stands out or there's no differentiating quality uh, to this reality. Uh, it's comprehensive, meaning that there's, there's nothing outside of it. And um, immutable, meaning that there's, there's, no, there's no possibility for it to be anything else. So that's what's so brilliant about Parmenides is he saw that's really what reality is and everything else is illusory. And then Zeno came along with his paradoxes and showed just how illusory space and time is. Now, of course, scientists and stuff don't like it nowadays. And, and you know, they say that's that's been resolved, Zeno's paradoxes, but that's not true. Like people think that uh, Planck length is an actual measured, like a metric for space. That's actually bullshit. That's, it's not a metric. It is It is actually a limit to what it's a boundary and a limit to what we can measure of space, but it has nothing to do with like the, the fundamental unit of space. That's not actually it. So I actually looked into that. Um, so if people are honest in the scientific community, they'll realize, yeah, Planck length doesn't mean we've figured out space. It just means that we've come to a certain limit about how we can measure it. And so, um, space and time, uh, aren't relevant insofar as if you want to achieve conclusion, you want to really tap into perfection, you want a conclusive theory or experience or description of reality, this is the best way to look at it. I think Parmenides was brilliant in, in, in what he said there. Um, and then Zeno can show you how do you get out of space-time in, in his ways, right? Like for with his flying arrow paradox, which is my favorite, is like a flying arrow never reaches its target while it's flying like while it's flying so you you can think of, about it at any moment in time if you freeze frame that arrow is never actually it's not at its target um and then when it finally reaches its target um well it'll never reach it because it's while it's flying so that's the the the, the paradoxical aspect of it See, while it's I, flying I, i'm sorry i, I got I, yeah. they, those people who think so the paradox arises in within people's consciousness to think the measurement is describing the reality, where whereas the arrow actually hitting the target is the reality, right? They think exactly, that, right? They think that the relative realm that they are measuring is the reality, right? But it's it it can't yeah. even describe the reality of the arrow hitting a target. Like this, this yeah. shows that math and everything that's relativist, relativistic is not describing reality. Exactly. And it's what it is, is a prototypical thought experiment of what we're observing with quantum mechanics, because it's the same, same thing in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which we're going to get to later on. It says that you can't measure both the position of a particle in space and its velocity at the very same time. Or if you want to be more sophisticated and you know exact about it, the more you measure its velocity, the less you know about its position in space and vice versa. And so really the arrow is the same thing. While it's flying, you realize there is no such thing as space. And then you know when it reaches a certain point, which is at the target, there is no such thing as time. So that it's just meant to shoehorn you out of space and time to make you realize that Parmenides was right. See, Zeno was a student of Parmenides. So um, that's one way to look at the collapse or the singularity. Uh, it's kind of amazing that we're not talking about anything new, but what we are doing is um, doing something new for our level of understanding in our, you know, in our time. So um, the cool thing about the collapse and the singularity is Kamal Gorov, okay, he he was a um, Russian mathematician back in the Soviet area or er, era, and uh, he was I, I I guess people use his work for encoding and other things. I'm just recently got into Kamal Gorov, but the the uh, its complexity is really it, it's a, one of the things that was explained to me by um, Spiral. I forget his name, his real name there, but uh, from the Toad Discord, he's brilliant, this guy. Um, he said that, imagine trying to, like the least amount of information required to encode the greatest amount is ultimately what uh, Kamal Gaurav complexity allows you to do is to encode information. And um, the ultimate Kamal Gaurav complexity re really comes from zero, 
I mean, zero is the least amount of information. And at the same time, it's everything. So this goes back to division by zero and how everything is in a superposition and that there's an infinite amount of space, time, energy, matter everywhere at all time. Uh, you can look at it like that in a complex way, or you can look at it as the least amount of information when it's all compressed into one bit or zero or a superposition of zero and one. And this is what the singularity is all about. This is what non-conceptuality is about. Um, and then here, I've written here that infinity seems to contradict this because, yeah, when we start to look at complexity going outwards as it projects and we start to involve time and arbitrary start starting points and levels and all these different cities and stuff that we've seen in, uh, in JCT and our primary experience of everything, well, obviously, you start to say, well, there's no way that how can there be space and time and be a spaceless, timeless reality at the same time how, how can there be because simultaneity one, because one of the things is an illusion that's the only way to well you can <laughs> say it that way we are but something this to is be what it is not but that's that's where the paradox comes in i mean if you say that it's an illusion then what then the it falls into infinite regress itself what is an illusion is an illusion real right so what is real and what is not real is not relevant in unity theory because it's all real. It's just, you know, you can, and it's all not real at the same time. There's an infinite regress of the paradoxes themselves. And that's where my work comes in so that you can understand that. But really there's no need to debate what is an illusion, what isn't, what's real, what's not real. Because obviously if you could collapse it, if everything was collapsed, then we wouldn't be around, you know, to talk about everything being collapsed. But at the same time, we're not, here uh out of nowhere we're here out of pure potential out of everything out of out of the complexity that emerges from eternity so you know what i mean like once you surpass these ways of thinking of what's real what's not this binary duality that is it you have to realize that there is a, a, a an infinite regress of that paradox as well basically so i'm but getting a bit too abstract basically here basically throwing your arms up in the air and saying that there is no conclusion you're saying basically fundamentally. No, no, I'm saying I'm saying that there is a conclusion, but but that conclude. So remember that quote that I said the other day. If we were to be as wise as we can be, we would be we would stay silent to be go to become God, and we would speak only when we need to be men. It depends on the perspective of the observer. If you're looking at Daniel's world and theory and reality and the primal thing that we experience, then you know, everything is real. Uh, and then if you're looking at it from your perspective, which that, which there's no, there is no perspective, then everything that we experience in our primary lives and in our primary experience is an illusion. But really when you realize that if, if everything emerges from that singularity, then that illusion is just as real as the singularity itself or, or eternity or being or awareness. So like, you know, this is why uh, I think it's it's senseless and not relevant to to ever debate with atheists or religious people or, you know, we're all right in a certain point of view. Um, and so that's where it becomes paradoxical. You can either experience the truth or you can talk about it. If you're going to talk about it, you're going to have to talk about it in these two ways because we function as a duality. And this actually goes back to Gnostic knowledge, uh, the Pleroma and these big esoteric ideas that were actually correct philosophically and um, showed you that. But uh, people said, well, it's esoteric. It's all woo-woo. There was a lot of woo-woo surrounding it. But really, this is something that Roy and I have been discussing for a long time. But again, what I'm going to put to you, Roy, is that, is if everything is an illusion, what is an illusion? Is an illusion real or not real? Everything's an illusion. You I'm know? saying that all experience is an illusion. The, the state of yeah. dreamless sleep basically is the reality and the world I, and time and experience arise and pass within that frame of reference, which is nothing that can be described. Like it's, it's, it's sure. not an, ex, it's all awareness. There's no content. Yeah. And yet you're around to say that that's we we can go around in that circle, right? That loop. And I think that's the, the one thing that might look like I'm just throwing up my hands in the air, but no, I, I do think that that loop is what we're trying to bring to people and say, 
here it is. You can either have conclusion or you can have utility. I think uh, I think what you said about if you want to talk about it, then that is a certain relative truth. But if you want to be it, then you have to actually shut up. And that's where my theory goes. Sure. It goes into the experience, right? It completely transcends exactly, exactly. all of the concepts and just gets right to the being. And that's, that's finally mm. the conclusion is the beingness without any thoughts. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was saying th that I wrote here that triunity, which is your system that we're going to look at next is what shoehorns people into the experience of truth and not the conceptual aspect mm -hmm. of truth. So yeah. if you want to conceptualize it, I do think unity theory is the way to, to, to do it, to, to yeah. say, okay, look, everything is illusory from the point of view of collapse and, and from the point of view of emergence, uh, it's, uh, it's not about that's why I'm trying to get away from the word illusory and real because but you know, I don't know from the can, point of collapse if you're talking about a why like if you actually want to yeah. address the why I think you need a conclusion right yes I so I, I we'll get we'll get to the why uh later as well because actually that's part of the slide I have the how and the why so we're getting yeah, yeah. to that. See, how does it all work? The how answer. I've got to stop interjecting because you got 25 yeah. slides, so I'll, I'll shut up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Sorry. I just want to get through it pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah. Shut up. really, the next thing is the, is that. So we said that tri, tri, the triunity is an access key to non-conceptual being. So if, if we don't have unity theory, we don't have anything, you just want to have, to have the most comprehensive, conclusive experience of truth and fundamental reality then you're going to go to uh you're going to have to find a way to get there which is meditation or making love or smoking pot whatever it is you do but um if you want to do it through thought if you want to do it through actually thinking about the world um you're going to use the triune system and it's the simplest most brilliant way to do it because it actually these thoughts lead you to stop thinking which is kind of a weird one, but that's what happens with non-conceptuality. Um, so I just want to make sure I've covered everything here. Um, yeah, there is this paradox of non-conceptuality, just like there was a paradox in uh, in in um, in JCT as well. Uh, but uh, we're not going to discuss it now. That's not relevant uh, really that much or very important right now. So um, the triunity uh, is maybe do you want to take over Roy just give you a bit of a I think people might be tired of my voice no I think you're a far right. better speaker than I am that's right. what I think <laughs> okay just thought I'd give give the shot give you a chance so really what triunity is is well first we'll describe the zero and the potential so that those are the two correspondences that we could use uh, or qualities if you will that um, describe eternity and eternity is that absolute immutable, you know, backdrop of reality that Parmenides was talking about. So mathematically, we say zero. Um, conceptually, we say potential. And then this actually keeps going infinitely, of course, because we're starting uh, a reality of, of structures and illusions and however, whatever word you want to use. Uh, but all of those structures, they all equate, they're all in a superposition to the zero or, or that state that we can't talk about. So really, um, it's all real because it comes from that state. That's, that's what I was trying to say there. Right? So anyway, yeah. how do you have that collapse? Well, um, let's say, so I'm only starting with the very first two levels here. Um, and I actually have a, uh, a graph that starts to go through many more levels so you can see uh things and understand them a little bit better and i have a video as well that it's explaining the triune system and and all the correspondences and, and all that so if anybody wants to do that just go into the description um but for now we're going to go for the top three levels because this is where the special stuff happens this is where the metaphysics comes into play so in order to understand this you have to sort of look at this in a visual representation of the of the triune so the, the relationship between the three aspects of reality we said circularity we said infinite regress and an arbitrary starting point well this is similar but here we have uh the potential okay so this this is why i said that 
the triune is a reflection of the trilemma and the trilemma a reflection of the triune uh one of these things represents circularity one of these things represents uh infinite regress and one of these things represents um, an arbitrary starting point when you're looking at zero one which is a superposition it means that it's both zero and one at the same time it's arbitrary if you choose one of them because they're both the same thing and if they're both the same thing then whichever one you choose is whichever one you choose is relevant so what were you going to say sorry it's brahman and atman brahman and atman exactly so it's yeah so this relationship between what is arbitrary and what is relevant it's both it's that's the paradox of it but i think the way i just said it kind of shows you how it's not really a paradox that really an arbitrary starting point is made relevant as soon as you choose one okay and so that is what superposition is circularity is obviously this relationship that reality has with itself which is that it emerges and collapses at the same time and space but of course we always think about it in terms of time and space but really it's 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 supra physical which is it's emergent and collapsing outside of time and space just time and space is a part of the, the whole game so that's where the circularity comes in and then infinity was what projects forward from that right as we have this timeline and space and all these discrete units and, and the rest of the world so really um that zero potential uh is also something that has been talked about in other religions like the Tao or tao uh in Taoism, um or the pleroma in gnostics gnosticism and so on but really potential i think is the most clean like logical thing that we can come up with like word um and this becomes relevant later on when we want to answer the why uh you know the all of this is the way it is so remember that word potential um so potential is in the center as you can see and it, it, it has three aspects this is why we have um these three qualities of the same thing you have the superposition uh of 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 potential which is what well it's potential and actualization right you have the world which is here infinity and we have the potential and it's those two are in a super superposition so when you split things up that way you can start to see how everything is one and it collapses to the zero so extra extrapolating from that we can go to thought right because you some people would say well no the first thing you go to is space and time but what we're saying is is well space and time emerges from what right and it emerges from thought consciousness which is what science is looking at but blindly trying to say something else they say oh yeah okay there seems to be something that happens with consciousness the observer effect uh you know um the double slit experiment and so on okay so we acknowledge that consciousness is relevant in some way but it's got to be relevant in a physical way and we're like no no it's relevant in a consciousness way you got to look at it from an observer point of view which is why we're starting here with uh consciousness i being identity and and so i am thinking and it is 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 in a superposition as well right what is thinking the i and what is i well it is being so really th thought and identity are really just being so this is why i have identity being and thought and really the reason i have two phrases uh in each level is because we understand things in a dualistic manner so the very first thing is what i call if i have it here yeah one is red so the red is a function and green is a definition so uh and i don't have it color coded here so green is the definition it's underneath yeah okay so we have to define everything and what are we defining we're always trying to define some kind of function some kind of thing right that's what theories of everything are all about We're trying to identify put our fingers on something so identity is the definition of what of the i which is the function uh, you know um so being is the name that we give to am thought is the name we give to the function or the action of thinking and so from this emerges uh everything right we have this is happening so that's where we're starting to have space and time coming in um this is re re in reference to an object um is is in this reference to a state and happening is in uh, reference to a space time so i don't need to um go forward i think it makes sense it goes ad infinitum right right here 
Um, and then JCT, if you think about it, uh, jumping continuity theory in relationship to try try the triune system, well, all these levels, right? You could plug in everything that we have in on his graphs, right? So we have electrons, so the um, atomic level, we have the cellular level, and it goes on from there. So that is um, how JCT gets plugged into the triune system, and then it all collapses to this zero because on either side of this middle column. They, they reflect each other, they're in a superposition. And then, so you only really have the one column. And then if you realize that, for example, society emerges from the family unit, family unit emerges from the human, human from the cell, that it all collapses vertically as well. So they collapse on uh, from one side to the other and then vertically all the way up to the zero and welcome to non-conceptuality. You start to look at the Trion system and you realize uh, it leads to zero, to non-thought, uh, to you know, put pure potential again. So um, that's the try on system for everyone who uh, hasn't really been exposed to it before and is a key component in, um, in the unity theory. And so look at the video. I think I've put it here as well. You can pause the screen or I'll put it in the description and you can look at the video that explains the Trion system in detail because there are correspondences here. Um, in, in this video, I, I also show like like visually a bit more what we were talking about, that smooth continuity between levels while they're infinities of themselves. Uh, they, they are entire infinities. And so there are that's where Contour was talking about. There are infinities within infinities. And then on the other side, we have axioms, um, which are just... Uh, points of reference for truth. Um, so there seems to be a correspondence between axioms, uh, the things that we plug into the triune system and then the infinities that emerge from them. But they also have, you know, meaningful correspondences. So philosophically, religiously, these, these things that we're experiencing, these levels that we're looking at, they have translations, right? So when I say I am thinking, that's the cogito, I think therefore I am. Well, that is I am that I am in religion, in, in the Bible, right? Or in the Greeks, of uh, Greek philosophy, the logos, the word, a piece of language. Um, you know, when we say that this is happening, we're re in reference to philosophy, we say we call it the prime mover, or I am God, if you want to be more religious about it. Uh, speed, place, and light, right? When we're talking about velocity and, and photons and, and positions in space, let there be light in the Bible, right? Or Heisenberg's uncertainty, if you're a material reductionist. Just wanted to show you those first three or four levels so that you understand just how important the Trion system is because it gives you, it synchronizes everything. It starts to show you how everything is related and can also all be collapsed and also all emerges. It's a very great way of organizing all of this stuff that we've been talking about. So then the question is, how does it all work? How? And there are some visual representations that we can use these cool little tricks that can start to give people a bit more of a grasp on um, how things work. This looks complicated, but it's really not complicated. I'm going to rush through this pretty quickly so that we can get to the more substantial stuff, uh, which is the why. Uh, and we can start also having a bit of a discussion. But um, really, if you're a person that's trying to understand space and time and how it's related to the zero, well, really just look at a point in space, imagine a point, and it has zero dimensions, it's just a point. You can't really imagine nothingness, but you can imagine it as a point for representation. Now imagine splitting it in two, so you have two points. Well, you immediately as you do that, you draw a line, and that's what this line is here. And what is that? It's the first dimension. Uh, so then we have direction forward and backward. So when th consciousness thinks or when awareness or potential starts to move or emerges, what it does is it creates dualities. It creates dis separations, right? That which Parmenides said is all illusory. Well, and then they, always separations... collapse, they always collapse back into unity too, right? Because two points is exactly. a line. And a line is one thing, and two lines is a plane, and a plane is one thing. So exactly. this is another expression of expansion and collapse. Exactly. That's a great way. I never thought about it in those terms before, but I also show that too. Um, and so, but the necessary thing to think about is that once that division happens, this is the, the interesting thing, 
it only happens once because when you're separating a, that which is inseparable, right, was the paradox of it all, but when it separates itself, it separates itself in an infinities of infinities of infinities at the same time. So each point, every separation is being separated. All, this is why there's like this big boom. It's just everything all at once or nothing. And what we experience as progressive is really just because of our point of view. But so when you've split that very first zero dimensional point, that first thought, that first emergence, well, it's also really has split those two points that came from it at the same time. That's the simultaneity of it that I was saying that really emergence and collapse are happening simultaneously. Well, the simultaneity also applies to space and time right we are space is everywhere and at all times that's what's so strange about well how can it be everywhere and at all times because there because the eternal potential of it all has no properties of space and time it's it's everywhere and in all times right so so anyway so that's what creates the plane you have the first two dimensions right the square and like by that same law or rule that everything gets split at the same time it's one separation one distinction um it creates a cube. So those four points that initially came from the one or from the two, which is also the one, and you can see how everything emerges and collapses at the same time, you have the cube. And in, inside the cube, you start to have different directions, right? This is the world that we know that we experience. You know, we have uh, forward, backward, left, right, diagonal, up, down. And by, by extension of those axes of freedom, we, we can move in spirals. And that's kind of uh, what the JCT is. It's a spiral. You know, that's why Daniel was saying, look, it's important to look at this as logarithmic and not linear because it's in extra dimensions too. It's not just flat on a line, right? There's there's more to this. Um, so uh, really what happens is after the three dimensions that we know, we have the fourth dimension, which we can't really conceptualize because it's higher than us but we have representations or like a shadow and that's Carl Sagan came up with a really cool video and a neat way to explain that. He, he put a cube over a table and you can see that the shadow was a square. So that was the two dimensional representation of the three dimensional object. Well, for us, the hypercube, which is the, the shadow of the fourth dimension is this is what it looks like. It's a cube on every single face of the cube. Now, the interesting thing is here's where we can start to look at collapse again. Because you take a, uh, well, you could have done this with a regular cube too, but you take a, a here I, I have them uh, in red points. I have red points, but I have to get a bit closer. See, if you take a zero dimensional point out of which all the other points and vertices of the, of the dimensions that emerge from it, if that point gets aligned, meaning you're starting to close, you're starting to collapse just once, Okay, so you put one point with its opposite, which that's the duality aspect of reality, right? If you align the two, you get this perspective. Everything is collapsed into some other sort of geometry. Um, and we can look at, uh, but, but the point is that when, when you collapse, it actually collapses. There's no more three dimensions. Like right now it looks flat. It looks like two dimensions. And two dimensions is what? It's like a shadow of the... It's like uh, now we're starting to look at exponentials, but like four dimensions. So you have two, four, six, eight. So these that's, a, that's what we call a, a sequence. So sequence emerges out of reality as well. Um, yeah, the, so the now you're starting two, to see you that. See you can visualize it as a cube or you can visualize it as a, as a pie, right? Exactly. You with your vision, so, it, it pops in as a cube or it pops out as, as a pie. Six, exactly. Eight. So... Yeah you can see a three dimensional thing. And then, so from four to two, it collapsed from four dimensions to two, right? Just from, from having in the observer you. So you have to do this with, with an actual cube. Like you actually put the two points, align them together with your point of view, with your observation, and you're going to see that it looks flat. So that's literally how the collapse can happen. Right. Um, and another way to visualize that too, is that, that potential, what I like to do is uh, think of a zero dimensional point and then try to put a zero dimensional point on every surface. There's no surface, obviously, but if you were to imagine it as a ball, try to put uh, a ball on every part or on yeah, the entire surface. You cover the surface of the ball with more balls 
until you fill up an entire room. So then you realize, yeah, like this space is also nothingness. It's also, you know, zero dimensional points, which is why I have this, that uh, one side is black and that, you know, everything is, and it equates itself. Um, but I also have it on this side too. So yeah, this is just another more complicated way to look at it. But on any line, any arbitrary point in infinity, right? All these points are also potentially lines and it and and they're all zero dimensions they're all zero potential so anyway um then we have to ask but what of matter and energy so in that space and time right the, there's matter and energy and we saw that einstein showed that space and time are one and the same thing in a way they're connected why because everything collapses to one thing anyway but um we have also matter and energy that are connected some people don't realize that we we have a word which is space-time but we don't really say matter energy or menergy or whatever you want to say <laughs> but they're they're the same thing that's actually e equals mc squared i think kind of that famous equation talks about that right that um it's energy equals mass which is you know matter um celeritus squared Celeritus means the speed of light um, in an exponential manner. So really, they're they're transmutable. You have matter. This is what atomic bombs are all about. You you know, uh, matter translates into energy, and energy can be compressed into matter or whatever uh, the correct term is for compression or of energy. But um, we have to understand now. Now we don't just have space and time that emerges in those ways, which I've just given a visual way to understand how it emerges and collapses. But then we have to understand: well, what about energy and matter within that space and time? What are the relationships between uh, those ones? So, the limit that we're at now, the 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 final frontier of knowledge that we have now, finally for for that for understanding matter and energy is the heisenberg uncertainty principle it's everything that we're experiencing in quantum mechanics this strange world that is completely contradictory to the classical physics that we experience in every day-to-day -day life if if i turn a ball on a ta table right or you know clockwise um it can't be going you know the opposite direction at the same time but yet in the in the quantum world that's what's happening so these weird effects that we're looking at. And one of the things that I think I've figured out is that the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which states that you can't um, measure a particle uh, and you can't really determine its position in space and its velocity at the same time. Uh, that true. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually correct. But the question is, why is it correct? Okay, and using unity theory and everything we've discussed up to now, we can actually um, come up with uh, a reason and we can couch it into a higher truth and uh, uh, like place it within, uh, nested within a higher truth. So here I've written, at any given time, if you fixate on the traveling particle, all you can determine is its velocity along the line in relation to the other two points. Okay, forming the parameters. So when you're looking at space, you're actually creating those two points to see the line in between. Okay, you're 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 creating space basically. Okay, and but then when you're fixating on a particle moving along that line, you you can't focus on those other two points anymore. You're just using them as a reference point to try to measure the velocity of that particle. Okay, so that's really Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and it makes it kind of makes sense. So the question is, why can you no longer determine its position when you're looking at its velocity? And it's because on the outsides of the parameters, okay, out, out of these two that you've used to create space, there is an infinite amount of potential for space and time. Therefore, there's no finite and absolute parameter for you to retain any relative position. You therefore either have to have relative speed or position, never both. This would constitute the reason for why Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is what it is. In a way, it's couched or nested in, within this truth. Furthermore, it shows how space-time equals matter-energy because if all those things are the same thing, which is consciousness, then creation must be the act of separation or the law of identity. 
A equals A, which is to say that you form a discrete quality to any given point. If it is meant to be an anchor point for space, it cannot also be a particle with velocity. Otherwise, they collapse back to the singularity of pure potential. So uh, Heisenberg is uh, correct. And really what this is saying is that he's correct because space and time it exists within eternity and eternity has no parameters. This is why you can't measure both velocity and position. You can create one or the other. Now, is it possible for higher forms of consciousness to maybe be able to do both? It's, it's very possible. Maybe it could happen, right? There are things we can do that apes can't and that cats can't and that cockroaches can't intellectually in, in speaking. So there it is. Um, just one of the potential things we could perhaps pull from unity theory is explanations for why we observe things the way we observe them. Um, so now we can pull together everything into this final point. And then from here on out, it's really just a debate and a discussion of the implications of unity theory. Uh, we have the trilemma resolved, right? We have circular reasoning, infinite regress, and an arbitrary starting point that we've looked at from multiple angles. And really, if we look at it on a timeline, which is the easiest way to look at it, right? We have regress, we had said is, well, if you look at this point, well, you have to explain it by the previous point, which is here. And that regress happens on either side of the timeline, right? That if you go towards the future or forward, it's really only in relation to where you are, the observer. And so it, it doesn't make sense whether, it, well, future and past are the same thing because there is no such thing as time. If you look at the emerging world in relation to the collapsed world, uh, and so you have here infinity. This represents time because it is composed of discrete units, right? So any arbitrary point on the line. And then all these arbitrary points are not arbitrary at all because any one of them represents the observer looking either forward or backward on the line. And it cannot see that this infinite timeline is actually circular. That's where circularity comes in. That the points that we cannot see or the limits principle in JCT on either side of that infinity is really curving around to be one thing, it, to be collapsed. So this is the relationship between non-conceptuality and JCT, guys. This is it right here. It's a very simple infinite timeline that we're too small to realize we're on uh, this big circle. And this has been discussed already in science as well. They think that the universe is that, is a sphere that we keep going back to the same point, except that they're still conceptualizing it with space and time and matter. And, and then it just leads to that infinite regress again, which is, well, a sphere suspended in what, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're right, but they're not right. They're just not applying it to non-conceptuality. Is It's not a conceptual thing. It's not spherical. It's not anything. It collapses to zero, and you have to fucking experience it. Um, so it's kind of ironic. But uh, eternity, this represents space, because like with space, we don't see any units, any discrete units, nor any limits to it. So space is smooth. Uh, Planck length, like I had explained before, isn't an actual discrete unit. It's just what we create, like measurements, when we actually try to measure it. But, um, you know, we have the space here, and we have the time here, and those things are really um, there, but not there at the same time. And you, you can see how these are just boundaries between the two worlds. And that's what, Roy, you describe, um, the, that side of reality, of that world of pure potential. And then Daniel ex ex explains uh, and describes the emergent how, world. Yeah, how so it there it is, guys. Um, they're not errors. The, the trilemma is just the, the qualities that we run into time and time again, no matter how we slice it, because... Those are the only ways we can, that's how we function as human beings, the only ways we can per conceptualize. And that's why paradoxism is what it is, right? Is it's a paradox in your mind. It's an experience in your consciousness. That experience points to the truth of what everything is. But people keep saying, no, we gotta, we gotta figure out this trilemma. It can't have infinite regress. It can't have an arbitrary starting point. And I can't have circular reasoning because those things don't apply to utility in the world. It doesn't allow us to be linear. It doesn't allow us to build shit and to do whatever. And it's like, well, then you're not into the business of a theory of everything. You're not trying to understand reality or prove truth at all. Um, because those three things really 
are actually the truth. It's just you have to understand the relationship they have with each other. And that's what we're all doing, guys, the three of us with unity theory. Okay. So now people are going to say, what are the implications of this and how can we get more specific? I'm just going to throw this out there real quick. Um, the relationship between all the forms, right, and how they emerge from each other, that going back to that paradox of JCT, well, how can there be jumps in continuity and what so on? I don't know, and that's a science that maybe will exist and maybe the only way to get any truth in that way will be through mathematics or some other new form of science that we might have down the line on the next paradigm shift. But for now, I think that we can at least have a correspondence between like what is what is the quality of chemistry in relation to the quality of molecules and, and multicellular life and all these other levels? How can they have a correspondence that perfectly reflect each other? And that's what uh, the Enneagram, I believe, does from Gurdjieff. Again, this is considered very esoteric, but I think, guys, we've really w went beyond that uh, mark anyway. I think lots of people are thinking, well, this stuff is just esoteric, but it's not. It's pure logic. And then here, you have to look into Gurdjieff. I don't understand it myself. There's a lot, but I met a guy in Colombia who's a student of Gurdjieff's, and he explained to me, and it made a lot of sense, that there is a one-to-one -one ratio or correspondence between geometry, so like frequency, so out of when th thought emerges out of the pure potential, it, cre it seems to first arise as a as a frequency, right? And that's where you, Roy, you had des described your, your convex slash concave thing. Well, that's part of a, uh, it's like a crest and it's a dip at the same time of a frequency. And that frequency starts to, um, well, it's multiple frequencies at, at the same time that, that coalesce and have relationships to each other that generates sound. It generates quantum particles because that's what quantum particles are when you're talking about muons and gluons and supersymmetry and all that stuff well those frequencies are really just frequencies it's it's what seems to be emerging out of uh out of consciousness that come together the, to create these patterns and then it it corresponds with geometry it corresponds with musical notes it corresponds with math with chemistry even with emotions okay so this guy went really 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 deep and uh, Gurdjieff is like mind-blowing. So look into that. Uh, one thing that that Christian uh, Castaño, his name is, um, that I met in Colombia told me that really that's what he describes is that there's unchanging change. That's the eternal aspect of reality. And from there, and this is also something I discovered in my philosophy independently, is that from that eternal aspect becomes sequential change and cyclical change. So if you look on that timeline again, Cycles, you can have two, four, six, eight. That's a, you know, um, a cycle. But you also have a sequence, one, two, three, four. And you have the unchanging line or reality or circle. Uh, so there's unchanging change, cyclical change, and sequential change, all part of one thing. Um, so that's something that um, uh, Gurdjieff kind of uh, talks about as well. So look into that. Then we have the dangers. Roy, I think you're going to like this. Um, danger, simulacra and simulation. In the Matrix, and I'm almost done, as I know, a big speech. In the Matrix, the first scene that Neo, that you see Neo in, he opens a book and it's hollowed out. And um, it's uh, he's trying to get um, this floppy disk. It's like an illegal program that he's going to sell to this dude, right? So when he opens that book and it's hollowed out and he gets it, you, you see on the, the, the title of the book is Simulacra and Simulation. This is an actual book that exists. It's from a guy named Jean Baudrillard. He was a uh, philosopher in, uh, in France. He's dead now, but it's, he wrote this book in the 70s and 80s and it inspired the Matrix movies. Um, and in this, he talks about maps and territories and how everything is a reflection of everything else is just symbols and we're we're losing we're actually losing absence there is no more no more nothingness anymore we're getting rid of nothingness uh, because we're exposed to everything everything is filmed everything so back in his day it was just tv and stuff right and radio no internet yet 
no selfies with phones. But even then, he could see that we are getting rid of the, the absence of absence he was talking about. So um, that literally removes reality. He's saying that it, it is to get rid of reality in a way. You're not, not real anymore. And he, he, he didn't like it. And in fact, he didn't like the Matrix movies, which is interesting. But um, in the first page here, he says that the territory no longer precedes the map. So when we talk about mapping, we're talking about like language, for example, as a way to model the world. So we're trying to extrapolate and understand the world. But that world no longer exists in order to describe is what he's talking about. And it doesn't even survive it. So Roy, when you're talking about moving to the next paradigm shift in a sort of devolving way, this is what Jean Baudrillard was talking about, is that uh, we're, we're erasing reality um, and we're entering the real void. That, And that's why we were arguing about that, that nothingness does exist. That's the pleroma. It's just that it exists as a matter of something that consciousness is capable of being aware of and generating. And ironically, we can actually move towards that nothingness, that self-annihilation that, that goes even further than potential, uh, or at least it kind of negates potential. It's very devolving in some way. So I'm getting extremely abstract here, but it's just because I want to paint the picture of what simulacra and simulation is all about. And that this guy is a, another w guy that you could look into that can start to describe reality in ways that are very sophisticated and uh, that have a lot of meaning and um, implications that emerge out of unity theory as well. So does that make uh, sense, guys, so far? Are you still there? Yeah, you bet. Let's go into infinity. Okay, cool. And so what does it all mean? The why answered. And literally, I have three slides left. We're almost done. This is the thing that I can contribute. And I've been contributing in different ways throughout. I haven't talked about the... There are some, some things that we're talking about here, like infinity, for example, that needs to be... Um, proven because we can't prove infinity uh, physically, but it can be proven conceptually. And so a lot of unity theory hinges on being able to logically prove, for example, how, like how are things circular and how are, are arbitrary points arbitrary and all these things. And that work I can give to people. There's uh, written texts and so on. But all this stuff, people can say, prove it. That's the, the infinitely regressive problem of infinite regress, is you can always say, prove it. But um, the, the one thing that I've also discovered is this is the final why of everything. So we just described how and the implications, but now why is everything every, the way it is? And why is it this way, that this is an emergence and a collapse at the same time? Well, I like to say that, like, First, it's a question that we've had for the dawn of time. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because nothing is something. It is everything. So you can see in that paradoxes and circularity, right, and arbitrary points. It really ties everything together. It has its correspondences in language, logic, and a state. So in language, we would have to say potential is not potential unless actualized. So the idea of the eternal backdrop of reality, right, being potential, it, the reason that, it, so it is in a superposition with actuality, a physical world, uh, uh, whatever, if you could say that the physical world is really just thoughts and, and all that, is because it can't be potential if there's no actualization. Uh, actualization is what makes it potential. And and actuality is actuality because of potential, right? So the two are mutually defining in a way. And that is called an antinomy in philosophy as a type of paradox. So in language, that's the cleanest why, the answer to why reality is the way it is, is that potential is not potential unless actu actualized. So no anthropomorphism, completely logical. But if you want to understand or want, to, there's a name to that logic and what this entails logically it's a teleology and a tautology teleology means um that things are circular right you're explaining things by their very purpose for example uh, a leg is meant for walking right we know that a leg is meant for walking but what is it right so its purpose is to walk but it doesn't tell you what it is 
Exactly. And a tautology is to say things twice in a way. Tautology twice. That's how I remember it. Um, so you're saying the same thing in two different ways. Uh, so logically, uh, teleology and tautology actually work together. That reality, fundamental reality is a teleology and a tautology together. And again, it's a superposition of the two because we, but we only think in dualities. So now I'm very abstract, but I'm just saying it for the record. You can come to me. I can explain that what it means. And then the antinomy and the aletheia. Um, antinomy is simply a paradox where something emerges next to its negation. So the very thing that it can't exist with, it actually can only exist through that which cancels it out. That's called an antinomy, Greek for against the law, antinomos. And the aletheia is Greek for two truths. So they are two simultaneous truths that exist together, but they're, they're contradictory. So how can you have actuality, a physical world, uh, structures, all this emergence, and nothingness, uh, just a pure, undisturbed, immutable, eternal reality? Uh, well, the two exist at the same point. Um as in a superposition, that's a the, the those are the two truths. So, Roy, you're on the side of uh, the the truth of uh, collapse, and Daniel, you're on the side of the emergence. But really, they're both one and the same thing. And those those are the uh, paradoxes that describe that. So they work hand in hand. So there's a visual way to look at it. So here you have the law of the excluded middle which is a logical law that ex that exists only for us on our level, in our f dream, on our level of reality, or whatever you want to call it, which is, means that there are truths that have to be one way or the other. It can't be both. So that's how we experience the world. But that world, that level, exists within a higher supra-logical law, okay? The, the A higher realm where... You can have a physical world within the void. Uh, you can have two truths at the same point in space and time, and that's what eternity is. Um, it allows you to, to, to have all of it, having your cake and eat it too kind of thing. And um, I've really kind of uh, tied it all together in an equation, uh, the relationship that consciousness has to those two realities of emergence and, and singularity uh, or collapse uh, and to infinity, to, uh, to all of it. So we have infinity here. That's the timeline, space and time, how we visualize everything. Equates the antinomy. So that's this whole, all this in between these two brackets, that is an antinomy, right? An antinomy is two things existing because of each other. So those two things within the ant antinomy is consciousness, human consciousness or consciousness in general, in parallel with void or nothingness um, or potential, however you want to look at it. So consciousness, potential, being one and the same thing, they seem to be parallel with each other from the point of view of us, our observation as human beings. We can only see it in parallel, not as a superposition. Uh, but in fact, they are the superposition that's together. And they equate the ultimate truth. And I use the Greek word mono aletheia, which is single truth. But I also like this because it kind of says uh, um, mountain or kind of represents a mountain or a metatheos actually a metatheos beyond god you have to go beyond god to realize god in a way so it's a mono aletheia or a metatheos so truth equates itself it all balances out in this equation it's like the simplest way to compress everything that uh unity theory is so you can also look at uh how consciousness or human consciousness can actually tap into that paradox and actually start to to realize that everything is in a superposition as an experience just click on this link or go to this uh, video and i explain that there and that is unity unity theory in a nutshell um what do you guys think that, in a nutshell, nutshell exactly it'll never <laughs> it'll never be you know i i would so. like to add, add here something at the um... And how I try to explain uh, or just conceptualize the the nothing and something or everything um, from from the GCT standpoint. If uh, if I try to explain, I, I would like to try to explain 
then we can imagine us as uh, standing on a ball as earth and what we are the something at the first part and then um in the, in the reality cu currently in uh, here we don't see anything actually so so for for us the air is is could be the nothing we we have some we don't have direct evidence there is something we have indirect evidences there is air moving some somewhere the the next jump from this point of view if i imagine a dust particle just moving around here and then i imagine an atom on that dust particle and we jump into the perspective of the atomic world the atomic world um, would also could say when they try to ex experience the world they also see nothingness in their level but the important part is for the atom this air is so thick they don't see through a, or they they feel they are inside something but for us that is nothing because we don't see in our perspective so that's the limit what this scale what a human do cannot perceive there is nothing else for for us to experience here but for the atom if the atom experience this they're just living there just in quotes but if we would go on those they uh level of understanding and just being then they would also experience similar things what we but that would be the same same uh, difference as from from uh, humanity to the atom that this this uh, change is the similar as the atom to the next nothingness for them and there is also something in that way so this is how the con the in gct uh, tried to explain this as a infinite regress in this part but for us the limit is is actually what we can see and experience so that's how i try to explain mm -hmm. yeah so with our senses that's what the limit is with our consciousness the limit is inf infinite and that's why i was saying that uh the boundary between your theory and roy's is literally um consciousness it's the it's the observer and you can focus on that limit that reality of of levels and and the furthest that you can see from your point of view as a human being but from your point of view as a consciousness then you'll you'll be infinite you it's not even about seeing or experiencing a limit it's about surpassing any limitation is and so that's the the boundary between both of your theories and why my infinity limited equation reconciles both of your um realities right so it makes sense that that um that you would bring it up from the point of view of, of your emergence right because that's what you work with but uh essentially what i'm saying is that it it collapses like that's what roy is talking about is that everything you're saying uh is true but it also collapses to to oneness um and uh the implications of unity theory is very important because the, the so you deal with the relationships but roy deals with the meaning and uh the meaning of of that new paradigm shift is something that uh we we're not prepared for uh you know yeah so this this coming paradigm shift so where you where you have the evolution into cities right? Or, or let's say that everything that is in conceptual form, like institutions, like a family or the government, or like every basically everything that humanity has developed, to me, is, is devolution is de evolving, right? It's an unnatural evolution. So what what my my they science has, um, or physics has, spatial dimensions and a time dimension 
as their 10 dimensions. But my 10 dimensions, like if, if a dimension is um, a limitation, if you will, then or a distinction, then to me, the, 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 diff, the 10 dimensions are, are quark, subatomic, atomic, molecular, cellular, body, what you would call multicellular, I guess, um, planetary, solar, galactic, and then universal, right? There's, there's your 10. This is, so that's, that's the biggest cycle that you can think of, right? The, the, this is all samsara to me, right? So it's all samsara and it's all, if the reason for evolution isn't to stay alive as a biological entity, the reason for evolution is to, it's the game, right? You have, you realize, I'm saying that basically Hinduism is right and, and, and the number system is just an expression of samsara. It's just another holographic expression of the real reason for all of this, like the, the reason for all of this. So in me, in my perspective, in my model, is that if we follow thought into the digital realm, like basically just where we put our attention on the most will appear the most real at that time. So if all of the collective human consciousness is, is putting their attention onto the screen and then we go extinct by some, somehow we go extinct, then that will be the new iteration. Like we will literally be inside of, we will take ourselves to be the, the hardware and software of the system rather than the body mind of the system. But that's devolving. That is a lower level of self-awareness than what we have now. So the natural way of evolution to me would be ex evolving upon our extinction, evolving into planetary consciousness like Gaia. Now, I don't even know what that really means, right? Like, I don't know what it's like to have a planetary consciousness or a solar system consciousness or a galactic consciousness, right? But to me, your, there's, in your theory, is there such a thing as a, as a branch off that would be unnatural? Like, like a, a fork in the road? Or is it all just evolution to you? Uh, no. For for me is all evolution and um, but but uh, one point I think we can clear this from from one point of view from a humanity perspective that is a devolution because we are not going to live on the next level and that that how we lived before so that's you can think about this as the the unicellular. For the unicellular, that's just really small, but we yeah. constitute the of, then yeah. the unicell the unicellular uh, for the unicellular, the multicellular is a devolution because the unicellular doesn't it it, it inside the multicellular it and it's just that's the matrix but what we usually talk about. They, the unicellular in our body, they are they are feeling the matrix. They are feeling they are pushed to do something they don't really want, or in in some sense. So so this is uh, this is how you see you see for for us humans the next level is so so bigger in scale and so so much uh, further than us. We don't even we cannot communicate, and then we are devolving. Yeah. We are we are living. But we don't cannot really talk. Yeah, but that's where we come up with an idea of Gaia, right? That there is a planetary consciousness, and and let's let's think of it this way: if if reality can be defined as so, if something is dependent upon something else for its existence, then that which is dependent is less real than what it is dependent upon, right? So if you look into a mirror the way that the image is less real than the, that which is looking into the mirror is because the mirror image requires that which is looking into the mirror, but the, that which is looking into the mirror doesn't require, right, for its existence, the mirror image. So if, if, if human consciousness goes into 
the internet or whatever, right, into a quantum computer. Well, if that computer is destroyed, then that world is gone, right? But this world would still say this, this world, the, the, what I'm saying is the digital realm is dependent upon the physical realm. And the physical realm is not dependent upon the digital realm. So in this way, it's very clear that this is a devolution, right? It's devolving because we're moving into a, a realm that is dependent upon another realm. And that makes the realm that's dependent less real than the realm that it's dependent upon, right? It's very logical. So James, this is what I would say is a great definition of what's real, or we could be even say maybe temporary or whatever, but, but that which is dependent upon something else is less real than what it is dependent upon, right? And the mirror image is perfect like that. Yeah, um, but uh, you could extrapolate that going backwards and, and say, well, we're dependent on animals to survive in nature. If an asteroid hits the planet, we're dependent on our planet. Um, so really... Um, yeah, but that's the wrong... The we, planet... See, we, no, we want... know, but... the problem is that we're starting, like the one of the biggest problems yeah. is that when no, I know. we I'm just... die, we, 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 everyone is talking about the mind-body. And that's not, that's not who you are. So that's not the self. So when we always start with the self as being some sort of combination between a body, mind, some sort of, you know, abstract combination between body and mind, well, that is starting off wrong. So everything that you're going to extrapolate from that assumption that you are a body mind is going to be wrong. Mm-hmm. But you see what I was saying, though, right? Like I was trying to say that, uh, you know, by with your argument, it runs into that paradox. That because if you say, well, it might not be a paradox, but if you say that um, that which is dependent on something else is less real, uh, well, then it becomes very difficult to understand what is real because everything seems to be contingent on everything else. Um, at least insofar as the process of human life. But if you're looking at zoomed out on the largest of scales, um, it all equates to the same thing. So um, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to like shoot ourselves into a virtual world and, and just become consciousnesses or whatever or not. Uh, but uh, or like like in the Matrix, just be jacked in all the time and, and not even realize it. I, I, don't, I don't know because that's the that's the philosophical challenge if we move up or down that scale it, it all becomes relative so i i don't know you could see it as a devolution you could see it as an evolution it could be both uh insofar as what it means and whether it's good or bad i don't know um right now we're starting to divorce ourselves or move for a bit further away from unity theory, which is okay. And I think like these are just, I don't know how we could connect to unity theory and make it relevant or not, but inside this structural reality that we're experiencing. Yeah. I think like, um, we are, I mean, you could make the same argument for so many things. You could say that ever since we started using pocket watches, We've, we haven't been able to tell time very well or, or you know, as soon as we've came, come up with cities, we weren't able to really navigate so this is another, uh, forests. This is another you know? problem that I have with discussing my theories is that I put forth some statements, very few statements that seem to me to be accurate and reasonable. And like Paige said, someone else will go, yes, and, right? You just, you don't, you don't, you're not containing yourself within my argument like this is my argument and if it's valid while we make these points then you can't elaborate anymore we must come to a conclusion given these statements uh, it's but it's everyone valid. especially philosophers they just keep going on and on and on and on and they don't even think about what i present to them they just want to keep talking in the in the context <laughs> of no, no, in the context reality. so well, well there's two things happening here in the context of you know describing fundamental reality i agree with you in the context of this very narrow specific thing which is are we evolving or devolving by moving forward with technology then you you're you're trying to create a vacuum for yourself and say these are the parameters and you have to stay within them no you are right like 
you know, if we de if we're dependent on these technology, and that's what the Matrix is about too. If you're dependent on these technologies, then um, it makes you weaker, I would say for sure. Uh, but it makes you stronger in different ways, and that's what's that's why we've come together as societies. We say, okay, let's have agriculture. Now you can focus on just making shoes, and I focus on just guarding the crops and whatever, and we get stronger collectively. And that's why these levels tend to have collectivized and emerged so th there is a an aspect of duality to to it is all i'm trying to say so you could see it as a devolution of the human being absolutely we're smart we were smarter 150,000 years ago we had bigger brains we had uh you know better capabilities and now uh we can't i mean without my google maps i can't even go down the streets you know so and, and what, you know it, it's i would like to include the this by your argument by this right? so Suffering and happiness it, is the guide to truth, not correctness. So is, is humanity sure. experiencing, yes, less suffering or more suffering than it ever has? Okay, so that, now you're creating a different standard. Game, to Yeah. So by game, that standard... Suffering is increasing. Yes, so then by that standard, I would say we, we are moving absolutely. Uh, personally, I think we're moving further away than from what we... It is a devolution. We're that's, less that's happy, cool. we're less healthy. But the Absolutely. individual doesn't have to. The individual doesn't have to follow the crowd. No. Well, it does. No, the individual does. Like, go out there now and survive like a caveman. You won't you wouldn't be able to. Like, you can't even apply for a job now. Well, you can't. You, you theoretically you can, but but most people like like a child, for example, if they've grown up without knowledge of certain things and certain skills, you, it's like an animal that's been domesticated. You can't release it out in the wild; it'll die. So. As individuals, we are moving away from having agency, and that is a devolution. And in that way, you're absolutely right. But you see what I mean by your own argument that that everything is relativized in this physical world. Well, if you're going to use physical examples for uh, a metric of what's good and bad, you're going to have to realize that yeah, people are always going to do that to you. They're going to say, "Well, relatively to what are you saying?" Now, relative to suffering, absolutely, we're we're moving in the wrong direction. Yeah. Actually, there where I have uh, the, the debate or argument against Roy is, uh, is uh, I, I, see, I see this as a, as a natural process to go on these uh, steps. And uh, it's unfortunate for the human beings because we will be inside this bigger entity that is forming nowadays you already feeling this if you living in a city and you are doing all of the things that it needs to be done actually in the city uh, everything is looks uh, faster and uh, you have in individually you feel more struggle and suffering in in some sense because you know, you have to do what your your boss is saying to you and it is not fun. It is stressful and you don't want to do some insane stuff. But the whole system, like the city, is like forcing you to do this. So if you want to, you you cannot, if, if we do this and, and we try to um, do what you do, we just stop stop this uh, what we what the currently humanity does is we stops the stop there and we just go back to the the natural world so I, yes, if I you think yes. about that right so yeah so, but I but just then you focused on senses yeah yeah but the but inertia then, won't then let you, you just don't then you just stop developing the unicellulars if they make up the mind make up of their mind so to do stop then you wouldn't exist so that's what you need to check yeah, uh if it wouldn't exist the illusion wouldn't exist and it would just be reality <laughs> so here's a, here's why i'm going to give you an example like if you ever seen a, a video of uh of like oxygen cells being absorbed or like just cells as you breathe as a, as a human being breathes they're like these cells that moves really 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 fast right oxygen is getting carried by cells into like uh, the heart and the blood and all that and then it gets used and then it gets but it, all those a lot of those cells um 
or all that oxygen gets turned into carbon dioxide. And uh, is it carbon dioxide? I'm not sure if it's yeah, yeah, carbon the anyway. End product, yes. Yeah, so the end product. So it's like in Jarhead, that movie where, you know, he says, welcome to the suck. So they refer to war as the suck, meaning it'll suck you in. You, you have no choice. You're being drafted. You're, you know, and so it's like there's going to be it's like paradigm shifts or between breaths as as the body breathes, it expels it. It'll, it'll suck so many oxygen particles and then just, you know, expel it as carbon. Uh, but that breath allows for a new paradigm shift, which would be another second of being alive right in that human body. So if you extrapolate that forward as like humanity moving into a new paradigm shift as a collective i think it's inevitable we're not we can't escape it i mean there's going to be some individuals that'll be saved in a way which where yeah they can revert to a bit of an analog thing uh but it's a cycle it's a there's a circularity to it too right what does the body do it breathes in new oxygen so i i don't know if we can say that it evolves or devolves or that it's good or bad all we can say that there's going to be a lot of damage, a lot of loss, and there's going to be a new something that's going to emerge from that, and that could be considered good or bad. I mean, this is relativistic yeah. moralism, usually, but which I, death you know, includes a lot of suffering. But I think what's the yeah. most important thing about this unity theory is that we're, we're making it. Uh, I think Daniel would agree that there's a fork in the road coming up. There's probably fairly soon there's a new iteration starting right uh, one of these jumps is about to occur and what i want to let people know is that there is choice in this there is volition you don't have to go the way of the collective human consciousness which is i believe is entering this freaking digital realm you don't have to do it there's a fork in the road and you can tote you can go the other way right there's this is what I want people to know is that you can remain in this physical realm of the senses or whatever, this realm and evolve what I believe is to be naturally, or you can follow what most of humanity is into this fucking computer system, but there's a choice there. And, and yeah, I think there's nothing the way to take the other route is non-conceptuality. Yeah, like there's nothing that says that this path of evolution is the correct one. If you look at evolution as a system itself, there are plenty of dead ends where that didn't work and uh, wh those species died out very quickly because it, it wasn't in, in natural balance with its environment in some way. So I would say in that way, you're absolutely right. Like it's highly probable that the, the direction we're heading in is a lot, uh, it's, it's not the correct one to achieve that new paradigm shift because i don't know if you've heard of the younger dryers theory but there's a, a small portion of like misfit renegade iconoclast all the names you could come up with uh archaeologists and it really it was a journalist i forget the guy's name british guy anyway uh they 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 realized that there was a, a civilization a very advanced civil human civilization like two hundred fifty thousand years ago or something like that or or as far as 30,000 years, I think it was. Um, and that they had developed really high-end technologies, but that were using the natural laws of, uh, yes. or they were using, you know, so there were things they were able to do, but it wasn't like, they were, we weren't generating plastics and metals. Yeah. And uh, it, it was, we were able to almost achieve the similar things, but, but by using uh, more natural, naturally based uh, technologies, I don't know. But then this huge flood arrived because of some meteor shower or whatever, and then it just literally wiped out humanity. And then there was some civilization that w that actually survived it, and they sent emissaries out around the world, which is why we have a lot of similarities in, in some of our indigenous stories and religions. There, there is like a re referencing certain things that point to to this civilization or person that had come and shown these people around the world these new technology or these technologies that they used to have so that they can move forward uh, again and start up again. So this younger dryers theory is an, a good example of showing you how, you know, there are some technologies, some evolutionary paths that might be correct or better suited for certain things and others that don't, because I don't think they had the technology to, for example, subvert some asteroid. Now we probably could shoot a nuke towards, uh, you know, 
uh, an incoming but asteroid the and get rid of it. The, but the irony is the technology that we've developed is going to be our downfall. I believe. That, yeah, like this is the thing: uh, is like a solar flare we're, could we're could pop tomorrow. Nature. We're not learning from yeah. nature. We're trying to manipulate it. Ex uh, exactly. Yeah, but but I am I am in uh, disagreement here. Mm -hmm. But uh, so so let's try um, another argument. But but it's fine. We don't. And I understand. And it is it is uh, important. You have a choice here. You can be non-conceptual, and you can follow the the mainstream, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But what you have to understand here is. Uh, is bigger than than the just just the wrong turn. It is the whole whole Earth is go is just expanding together in this scale. What you and what is important, as I mentioned, the mainstream. It is it is really the mainstream. It is not just a metaphor. It means the eighty percent of people, eighty percent of people doing this. So if you if you departure from this path, you won't you won't catch up. You won't be there. So so there is there is the ultimate choice from in the humanity. The eighty percent will go there. In you cannot do anything about that because they are following without thinking about that. So that's yeah. really true. What uh, Roy say they. They don't really understand what it's what they are doing, but they are doing it nevertheless. And that's what your body is doing or the cells in your body. They also doing this. 80% is always doing the next step. And and it is it can turn a little bit, but you cannot you cannot alter this state. So what what you are doing, there is 80%, and that is going that way. That is going somewhere, and we cannot uh, individually change or something but we we can understand we are not in this sorry we are not we don't want to be in this side we can, we would like to go departure and then try to leave here and but what what is important 80 percent it means like uh, eight from 10 billion it is 8 billion and we can be just only 2 billion people who try to uh, be in this level we can do it but we can we we need to go we we need to network together and find it ourselves but it is hard because we are so far away only the the finest people arrive this conclusion the the regular people doesn't yeah. and and that's that's always always being the same so you won't be able to make a a society or culture ab around it because the majority is what is about so that's that's a little bit harder to understand but that's how i i explain no yeah i get it yeah absolutely yeah and none of it's wrong i don't want to say none of it's wrong right N none of this is wrong but you will have to pay the consequences right karma always comes yeah. due so there's nothing wrong with any of this. You're not wrong to go into the computer and play fucking video games and have it your reality. But there will be consequences. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think uh, on the, uh, the widest scale possible. That seems to be how I think. So I'm trying to understand, like, if 80% of the planet starts to go down that road of being jacked in all the time in the virtual yeah. reality and it great gives them axes of freedom and it allows them to do lots of stuff i can see how it doesn't it's not a natural evolution because well they're having there's an experience in consciousness but they're not building anything that, that's a it's they're not uh moving towards a new paradigm culture. shift it's all yeah it's going culture. inwards that way it's, it's a redundancy all, exactly it's going inwards uh, versus outwards so like yeah this is one of the examples that uh, they give in the scientific community as for why uh, you know um and uh fermi's paradox why we don't see intelligent life in the universe because mm -hmm. some of them have figured out oh look there's virtual worlds we could just live in these virtual worlds and we don't need to expand out into the universe now uh that you could consider a devolution but also because at some point 
even if you have to biologically engineer your body to be able to handle staying in a pod to 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 not waste away while you're in the virtual world living your best life or whatever uh <laughs> let's let's say uh, something in in natural reality like the sun you know they're talking about the carrington event happening this year actually could just have a solar storm and then no more electricity and then all those people die and that's it no more human consciousness yeah, this is what i mean uh, about reality and dependency yeah, yeah so this is this is obviously a problem now that's from the point of view of the human observer who wants to go on to the next paradigm shift and this might be a wrong turn but from from the point of view of unity theory and of the, you know everything I mean, it doesn't matter if humans go on to live or not because um you know everything is uh, you know one oneness i mean it, it maybe this is what ha this is happening somewhere else in consciousness in that fabric of consciousness there's other worlds other realities where you know other civilizations are taking right turns and wrong turns and whatever i don't know yeah no that's and i think that's what your unity theory does the best is is expressing that there's nothing our, wrong. our unity. Yeah, it's yeah. unity at the end of the day it's not <laughs> yeah okay okay but that's i agree that there's nothing wrong with any of this i'm not saying you should do this and you're wrong to do this i'm just saying there is such a thing as karma and, and the more that you go outside of the natural law, the more you have to pay for that coming back. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's all. Yeah. All right, uh, guys. That's, that's, uh, yeah, it must that's be late. Great. You are Daniel. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I need to go, but it was, it was really nice. I, I really thank you guys to that's, that's the, that's the beauty. All of us arrive to similar conclusions from us from a very very different perspectives mm -hmm. but what what uni unites us really is we would like to understand the reality as as best as we can and that's mm -hmm. i think we can agree on because that's what <laughs> i like, we that. like to do. i really yep. like that that is true it's unity great. right there yeah we want to share the experience too it's not just understand it for ourselves but we want to share it with each other so um i don't know i hope Unity theory is a, a good comprehensive theory. Maybe it'll help some people organize their own ideas or move forward in their realities or well, extract meaning opinion, from it. But it's better than 90% of what Kurt puts on his channel. <laughs> could be, could be. I, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> um guys thank you so much i appreciate you listening to a lot of that stuff you already knew but this is for the rest of humanity to to look at in the future and um again thanks for your time thanks for your effort thanks for your energy and to continue doing your work and um maybe there'll be a third iteration but so far it seems pretty clean but it might get cleaner i don't know all right guys take care bye bye <laughs>